Hello, and a very warm welcome to uh, part three, where I'll give a very brief outline to uh, this radio circuitry. I appreciate that this type of theory is not for everyone. I certainly remember, as a 16-year-old, finding radio theory very daunting. If it is not for you, part four will be uploaded very shortly. Now I'll begin. <laughs> OK chaps, it's now over to this circuit diagram. As can be seen, this radio is a four valve, including the rectifier. It is designed for 200 to 250 volts AC at 50 hertz operation. As I uh, pointed out in part one, it incorporates three bands, namely long wave, medium wave and short wave. Though on the surface this entire circuit diagram appears straightforward, it is, like all superheterodyne circuits, quite complex. If, for example, one was to take on the task of explaining everything that is going on, say, in this bush, AC31 circuit diagram, to the minutest detail, and back it all up with seemingly endless maths, you know the type, those very nasty formulae, algebra, calculus, etc., it would send most people's heads swirling, for sure. I'd uh, be one of them, since I'm truly hopeless at maths. One reason out of many why I avoid describing any circuit diagram as being simple. So, as can be seen, there is a lot going on here. I'll give a brief account, minus any maths, of what this circuit diagram is about. For those of you who are familiar with my vintage radio repair, restoration, modus operandi, I almost always begin with the power supply circuitry. If you are following along, especially beyond this point, be fully aware there are very high voltages associated with vintage valve equipment that are lethal. You are, therefore, doing so at your own risk. To my way of thinking, it is pretty much a pointless operation administering treatment to any other part of a radio circuit, say the IF amplifier, if there is no power for it to be tested or to operate. So, this unk of a component is the main transformer. It has a primary side though tapped for alternative mains voltages, is fed by 240 volts AC. DC, unless it is chopped, will not inductively pass over to the primary, which in this instance includes a high voltage winding of around 300 volts RMS, a 6.3 volt winding that can adequately deliver 0.6 amps for the rectifier heater and another 6.3 volt heater winding that is capable of delivering sufficient power for the rest of the valve heaters as well as the dial light. Here is uh, what it looks like on this circuit diagram. T2 is the symbol drawing for the mains transformer. The right hand side of this drawn symbol is the primary winding with its three tappings. For 110 to 120 volts, 210 to 230 volts and 231 to 250 volts. 240 volts mains is via the double throw single pole main switch located at the rear of the volume control potentiometer. Inputs the uh, T2 primary, thus creating 
the magnetic field. The secondary windings, already spoken about, are induced, producing required step up as well as step down voltage supplies. The 300 volts RMS being the step up or high tension is fed directly to both anodes of the EZ40. Now, the EZ40 is a full wave rectifier, but see here, both anodes have been strapped together. Therefore, it has been configured for half wave rectification. Its uh, 6.3 volt heater supply, as well as the 6.3 volt heater supply for the rest of the valve heaters, plus the uh, dial light are via step-down primary windings. V4, the EZ80 rectifier valve, only allows current to flow when its anodes are positive. Both anodes, being strapped together in this instance, are positive at the same time. Consequently, the waveform of the resulting DC voltage from its cathode across the load that being the rest of the radio, is not continuous at that point since only the positive half cycles are available. Therefore, the DC consists of a series of unidirectional pulses. To smooth the row DC directly from the V4 cathode, electrolytic reservoir capacitor C23 charges up close to the peak of the AC half cycle and discharges into the load for the rest of that cycle. For the majority of time, therefore, the low current is being largely supplied by the reservoir electrolytic capacitor. However, there is still a ripple effect at that point which needs further smoothing treatment. This is achieved via pi filter or low pass filter circuit uh, C23, R16 and C24. To smooth the row DC directly from the V4 cathode, electrolytic reservoir capacitor C23 charges up close to the peak of the AC half cycle and discharges into the load for the rest of that cycle. For the majority of time, therefore, the low current is being largely supplied by the reservoir electrolytic capacitor. However, there is still a ripple effect at that point which needs further smoothing treatment. This is achieved via Pi filter or low pass filter circuit C23, R16 and C24. In passing, I'll go on to mention the ripple waveform may be treated by ordinary AC theory if it is considered as a fundamental frequency with a series of harmonics. The design engineers at Bush Radio and Television Limited would have known the exact proportions of the pi filter for this radio as well as harmonics since they very likely would have applied for the analysis named after French mathematician and physicist Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier. If you are not familiar with Fourier analysis and would like to know what it is about, I have included a YouTube video link below which I suggest is an excellent introduction. In 1926, Dutch electrical engineer and inventor Bernard D. H. Telligen and uh, Dutch physicist Gils Holst invented the pentode valve by adding a third grid or suppressor grid to the tetrode valve, converting it from four elements to five elements, cathode, grid one, grid two, grid three and uh, anode. Here, in this radio from the early 1950s, is the venerable EL41 pentode valve, a forerunner of the equally venerable EL84 pentode valve. 
the EL41 fits into a BAT valve base. And the EL84 fits into a B9E valve base. From pipe filter circuit consisting of C23, R16 and C24, the HT rail, DC supply will be somewhere between 225 and 235 volts which is fed directly onto grid 2 of V3 and also the anode valves of for that valve is via primary of T1 being the audio output transformer. The cathode resistor R15 180 ohms which is accompanied with the C22 47 microfarad cathode electrolytic bypass capacitor enables positive voltage on the valve cathode of somewhere between 6 and 8 volts with relation to deck. R14 47k grid 1 stopper resistor is part of the valve biasing arrangement. R13 470k log potentiometer is a manual volume control and uh, C21 10 nanofarad is the top cut capacitor. As there is no triode audio output amplifier driver or preamplifier if you will, this radio is termed as a short receiver, I'll move over to uh, V1 ECH 42 triode hexode frequency changer valve. Preceding the ECH42 frequency changer, a length of aerial wire is plugged into the rear socket of this radio at point A, printed on this circuit diagram. Depending upon where the band switch has been set, signals enter coupling coils or bandpass filters L1 L3 and uh, parallel trimmer capacitor C25 for the shortwave band L4 and uh, parallel trimmer capacitor C26 for the medium wave band and uh, C1 600PF and L2 inductively coupled to L5 and uh, C2 85 PF capacitor for the long wave band. This is what they uh, look like. Depending upon the selected wave band and where variable tuning capacitor C27 is set, received radio station signals are fed via blocking capacitor C3 100 PF onto uh, grid 1 of the exode or mixer section of V1. Now purely for the sake of ease I'll jump across to the local oscillator whereupon I'll return to the exode section shortly. Local oscillator coils are L6 and parallel trimmer capacitor C29 where L9 is a reaction coupling coil for the uh, shortwave band L7, L10 and uh, parallel trimmer capacitor C30 where C9 515PF for reaction coupling is for the medium wave band and L8 in parallel with C10 33 PF C12 240 PF 
our series tracking capacitors where C11, 365 PF capacitor, is for common impedance for the uh, long wave band. This is what they uh, look like. All of the uh, local oscillator is tuned via tuning capacitor C28 which when rotated tracks tuning capacitor C27 on the same shaft and is fed onto the injector grid. Internal coupling of uh, V1 via coupling capacitor C7 56 PF. The EXO section of the ECH42 not only amplifies signals, though it is not in any way prolific, it, more importantly, mixes them. This process is achieved by superimposing or mixing the higher frequency oscillator signal with the received signal inside the hexode section to produce, among many other frequencies, four particular important output signals on its anode. These are the two original input signals, the oscillator frequency plus the received frequency and the oscillator frequency minus the received frequency. Did you get all of that? <laughs> Modulation on the received signal is also present on those last two outputs, producing a frequency which, in this case, is always 470 kHz above the tuned frequency, or above the dial cursor position. <laughs> From the frequency changer, ECH42, the IF signal is very weak, certainly insufficiently strong enough to be adequately demodulated to produce anything like a decent listening level of audio. It, therefore, needs boosting. This is where this wee valve comes into play. The humble EBF-80. Very mu pentode. It also incorporates two diodes, which I'll speak about shortly. The sole purpose of the EBF 80's pentode section is to amplify the intermediate frequency via tuned circuit transformer couplings C4, L11, L12, C5, and C16, L13, L14 and uh, C17. Here the double diode, Verimu RF stroke, AF pento sections are incorporated into V2 EBF80, which I have just been speaking about. The uh, left hand diode drawn on this circuit diagram is commonly referred as uh, the detector. Why detector? I can't, in all honesty, provide a logical answer. Nonetheless, the voltage provided by the output of the IF amplifier, V2 pentode section, consists of a carrier wave at the IF L14, which contains audio frequency or AF signal content. It is the same construction as the signal supplied by the aerial circuit, except the carrier frequency has been converted to the AF frequency, which in this instance is 470 kHz. Now, in order to uh, render this into an audible signal, it has to be separated from the carrier wave. This is where the left-hand diode section of V2 comes into play. When the IF cycle is ascending, or in the positive phase, pin 7 of V2 
the diode anode drawn on the left hand side is uh, at positive with respect to the common cathode or deck in this instance. Therefore it will draw current. So what is happening here? Since the diode is merely a rectifier and nothing else, certainly uh, not a detector, the audio content or top half of the IF signal which would be cancelled out by the bottom half of the IF signal if there was no rectification is the demodulated or audio signal. The audio component I was talking about, well, its rectified output is developed across low resistor R12 330k after it has been filtered via C18 100 pf capacitor R9 47k resistor and C19 100 pf capacitor making up a Pi filter circuit. It also passes via C20 2.2 nanofarad AF coupling capacitor to R13 manual volume control 470 K log potentiometer onto R14 47k grid stopper resistor to grid 1 of the EL41 audio output pentode valve. Now this radio has been designed to do something that is somewhat unusual. When operating the gram input the triode section of V1 ECH42 is switched so that it operates as an audio preamplifier. This is accomplished by, first of all, shunting the capacitor C6, 2.2 nanofarad, which in effect contributes towards tone or top cut sound along with R3, 680k shunt resistor is connected via S12 to R4 47k grid stopper resistor to grid of the uh, triode section of the ECH42. The amplified output via the anode of that triode passes through C13 one nanofarad coupling capacitor, thus enabling the audio signals to flow via S20 and on to the uh, top of R13 470k log volume control and then continues its journey to uh, grid 1 of the uh, EL41 audio output pentode valve via R14 47k grid stopper resistor. My final part of this Bush radio circuit synopsis will be the automatic gain control or AGC line. This part of the circuit is an arrangement whereby the gain of this radio is varied automatically in dependence upon the received carrier wave strength or amplitude. Or, in other words, as the carrier wave strength increases, the receiver's gain is reduced, and uh, vice versa. So, the strength of the reproduced signal is not appreciably affected by null fluctuations in received signals, should the incoming signal fluctuate too much, fluctuations in produced signals will be noticeable since 
AGC systems are not perfect. I'll expand a little on this in a minute or so. Moreover, though they do the job they are designed to do quite well on uh, long wave and medium wave bands, they are not quite so efficient on the uh, short wave band, where fluctuations over ranges are often subject to fading, having uh, received a distant station. The EGC voltage from the second diode of V2 on this uh, circuit diagram is applied to grid 1 east of uh, ECH 42 and uh, V2 EBF 80. This is accomplished by developing a DC potential across R12 330k diode load resistor which is fed back to uh, R11 680k forming part of the uh, AGC. Normally an AGC system will have an element of delay when responding to input changes. Um, in other words it is not desirable for reaction time to be too fast. Before a change takes place to compensate for the level of signal change the control voltage will remain constant for a short period of time, usually a few nanoseconds after there is a change in the signal level from say a central heating thermostat kicking in or someone in the house switching a light on or off or any other impulsive interference that has a very fast rise time that would be detected by the AGC circuit since it would very likely make the receiver temporarily less reactive during the hold time required to discharge the AGC filter capacitor C8 for 47 nanofarad. The design engineers working in the labs at Bush Limited designed this radio circuit so it made provision for accident delay time on the AGC. R10, 20 meg, R11, 680k and R12, 330k resistors form a HT potential divider from which a positive potential is applied to the second diode of uh, V2, maintaining it in a conductive condition in the absence of a signal and thus holding the AGC line down to a cathode or chassis potential which keeps it from conducting until a predetermined signal level or input carrier voltage has been reached. In other words, this develops no AGC feedback until an established received signal strength has been uh, attained. When this happens, the negative DC potential across uh, R12 counteracts the positive bias on the right hand diode on this circuit diagram, therefore it ceases to conduct. When that happens, the diode potential becomes more negative with uh, increased signal strength, which carries with it the AGC line via R8 1.5 meg decoupling resistor. <laughs> Phew, did you get all of that? <laughs> it was certainly a gobful. <laughs> It's now come to that time for realigning the second and the first IF transformers along with making adjustments to the RF and local oscillator stages. This Velleman DVM 13FMC2 frequency counter has been powered up for almost 10 minutes. 
It's uh, crystal lovely, it should be quite warm by now. This uh, ETH kit, RF1 new signal generator, along with uh, this Bush radio chassis. Yeah, it's quite as a mouse. <laughs> Has uh, also been powered up for almost uh, 10 minutes. As can be uh, clearly seen, this uh, RF signal generator is uh, spot on. I have the uh, gate time rotated to almost one third towards maximum on this uh, frequency counter. I'll uh, let everything simmer for a further three to four minutes then I'll uh, realign the uh, second IFT transformer that being the one furthest away from the uh, frequency changer and uh, load loss elator then I'll uh, rejoin you when it's time to uh, realign the uh, first IFT transformer that being uh, the one closest to the frequency changer and uh, local oscillator back shortly please excuse the racket this lot is making <laughs> a generous 10 minutes have passed by since i last spoke and uh, in that time, I set up my Evometer 8, switched onto the 10 volt AC range, which you will be watching as I'm picking up the first IF secondary and primary via a 100 nanofarad capacitor direct off the anode of the EL41 audio output pentode valve. Then I uh, injected a uh, 470 kilohertz tone or a signal via a 10 nanofarad uh, capacitor onto the uh, anode or pin 6 of V2 EBF80 and peaked the uh, secondary as well as the primary of the second uh, IF transformer. As expected it uh, didn't require much adjustment. I'll now move this operation over to the first IF transformer just here. Again my apologies for the noise. Believe it or not this tone or signal is being attenuated so as not to trigger the uh, AGC into uh, Operation. Right, here goes. That's about right just there. Back it up a little bit. That's it. Now the other IF. There, that should do. That was a very straightforward operation. It is uh, now over to the RF and oscillator alignments. Before moving over to that second part of the alignment procedure, it is important I check the position of the cursor with relation to the uh, dial number in and a substitute tuning scale fixed to the rear of the tuner drum. These types of radio with the main station dial fixed to the inside of the cabinet certainly cause a lot of messing about. Fortunately both the main station dial and the substitute dial on the rear of the tuner drum line up perfectly. 
right. It's onwards and upwards with the RF and oscillator alignments of the long wave, medium wave and uh, short wave bands. I must confess I began the RF and oscillator realignment process off camera. Past experience has shown that uh, it does slows can be somewhat hard to rotate and that was certainly the case in this instance. One of the iron slugs on the short wave began to shatter around the uh, screw slot. So much so it smashed the tip off my uh, trimming tool. They are designed to uh, do that. The opposite end is uh, very uh, distorted. You see that? But at least I haven't obliterated any of the iron dust slugs. I've uh, got the RF oscillator alignment pretty much spot on. But not before I cleaned around the uh, fixing screws so that I was able to get a good RF ground connection. It has took me almost 30 minutes to get this alignment procedure where it is. Not that it was far off the mark to begin with. So I'm leaving it where it is. I don't want to disturb it. Right. In part four, I will be doing the reassembly and uh, polishing the cabinet. I'll uh, point out in passing when doing uh, repair or restoration work on RF and uh, oscillator circuits, note where everything is located. And be meticulous when cleaning reassembling and realigning. It's very important. <laughs> I thank you for viewing. Your time and interest is always appreciated. Please join me again for uh, part four. Until then, take care and uh, God bless.